I'd like, I, I want to thank Rebecca for for a fantastic conference. Um, it's amazing. It's also funny. Uh, I'm going to talk about love. And we spent most of the conference in, in uh, the back door. Uh, but now in a hotel, part of my talk is about adultery. So maybe it's it's appropriate. <laughs> oh, thanks. Sorry. I also have to confess I have a bit of a hangover, so my senses aren't exactly perfect. Um, this text will float in abstract space, working in suggestive spurts through philosophical speculation, a fictional love letter, and poetry. Uh, just a bit about the title. Love, can love be singular, generic, lonely? A love implies the singular, the irreducible and the irreparable, that which cannot be fixed, that which is in its whatever singularity, as Agamben describes, the coming community. My reflections come after reading Agamben for many years. David describes me as one of the last people reading Agamben. <laughs> I go further, all I read is Agamben. And reading his philosophy is like an experience of love. Occasionally, I read his texts and have joyful tears, an elation that is as inexplicable as it moves me. But it's also impossible, like a utopia, like love itself. Always, the impossible is possible, and the possible impossible. This is potentiality, the experience of potentiality, the going through from the abyss of potential to action that gives us our subjectivity, from nothing to something. Poetry possesses its object without knowing it, and philosophy knows its object without possessing it. Faced with that, Agamben sets himself, quote, the impossible task of appropriating what must in every case remain unappropriable. It starts out with the experience of utopia, a topos uranos, a heavenly place. That's from stanzas. It is the gaudium, the joy of the stil novisti poets, the joy that never ends. Joy que mai non fina. This, uh, this utopia is a refined love, a fina mors, that at once enjoys and defers, negates and affirms, accepts and repels, and whose only reality is the unreality of a word, kamas taura e chats alebre ablobu e nadi contra superna, that heaps up the breeze and hunts the hare with the ox and swims against the tide. That's from Alno Daniel, quoted by Dante. Uh, so, another thing I want to talk about is experience. And I have this idea that experience changed in the 16th century, 17th century with people like Bacon. Um, and in a sense, they occulted the occult nature of science because they were alchemists in some sense. And they conflated or destroyed the separation between the celestial and the terrestrial that had existed for, cent for millennia, um, thereby reducing the essential difference between the eternal and the eternal. So science, as already a cult, in that it transformed the Neoplatonic, the alchemical collapsing of the, ter the celestial to the terrestrial, into the transcendental subject as substance. But on the other side, the occult is also a substitute for love. I'm going to quote a love letter, a fictional love letter from a novel I'm writing called Debbie, sorry, The Devil Does Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> but it's based on the film Debbie Does Dallas in some ways. It's about five, it's five narratives confluencing into one uh, parody. Um, and it's, it's about Dallas, which is 
about the 80s, but a city that arose out of the 70s, the disco inferno of the 70s. It's part of a trilogy. It's okay. There's nothing else. Um, uh, called the, the Divine Inferno. And uh, she, she, she's a bit like uh, Alice in Wonderland and also um, uh, Alice, uh, Wizard of Oz. So she gets taken by a storm, a, a, a Texas twister. Dorothy. Dorothy, yeah. And, and she lands up in Midlothian, Texas, where they burn tires for energy. And uh, she meets the devil, and they make a compact, uh, a pact, because he wants to get back into Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy. He needs to get back into the book, and she needs to save her her academic career. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she's get she gets a, a message from her lover, um, and she doesn't know what to do with it. So here's the love letter from him. Her name is Deborah. Today was a great day, as I was somewhat free from the pain of missing you. I thought about you all the time, and it felt nice and warm and close. True. Oh, this is by Messenger, by the way. Because uh, it's mostly happening on, on, her, on her cell phone. Uh, I thought about you all the time, and it felt nice and warm and close. True. We did communicate a lot, but it was, a brief, it was brief and in spurts, and unlike some of our longer video chats. Yet I felt quite wonderful, the feelings of love are overwhelming sometimes, and it can get painful when I'm alone and dying to be with you. But not today, because that feeling of loving was somehow a peaceful one. And it was just simply beautiful to be together virtually at the end. I saw you in a perfection beyond what people think perfection is. It was a perfection of you as you in your integral actuality, which is actually a dynamic flow of passion and movement that can't be seized by attributes or qualities but only a magical force of intensity, essentially uncapturable. Trying to capture that magic and trying to freeze it is killing it, as William Blake might say. If I could relive that intensity through language, that would be pure alchemy. But in a sense, language would have to allow itself to just be and be autonomous from that which it tried to describe, because it would only approximate and worse, capture and imprison existence. How does a poet do his, this magic task? Artificially. A swirl of magic feeling moves me, but re repeating, I love you, actually conceals the feeling those words would convey, insofar as they are received by you with your own intensities, your own affect, and vice versa. Love as a sort of alchemy, and poetry as a magic reinvention of the moment. Where did you come from, dear Deborah? How are you possible? How can such a great thing become? Where does the magic come from? One that needs no drug and that has no predecessor. Unpredictable passion, unforeseen passion, like life itself. Happiness requires magic. I'm happy when I behold you without possessing you. Possession ruins it. Blake's poem, Eternity, says, he who kisses a life as it flies lives in eternity's sunrise. But those two lines are preceded by, he who binds himself to a joy does the winged life destroy. And it's thus the same thing with poetry. A desperation to capture our love only kills it, so I let my words run through the great intensities, unpredictable ones that emerge as I think about you and everything else, while trying to make rhymes and meters and stanzas schemes. This is what Deleuze calls Depersonalisation par amour, depersonalization through love. There are several things to think about with respect to what I want to say, and it's all due to you, to my feelings of love for you, to what we share, which I believe is magic insofar as it is inexplicable, not even by the reductionisms of neuroscience. When a soccer player scores a goal, does knowledge of the role of quantum mechanics in that goal really matter? Does physiology ultimately hold the key? Or is it the world of experience that the athlete has gathered? Trying to grasp the experience of being in love by looking at brain scans is perhaps further obscuring the process. Explaining it through the secretions of dopamine and other chemicals does not provide very much insight into what 
it is to experience love, except to say that such and such a chemical process occurred, such and such synapses were fired. What does it matter? So what then is experience? That's the end of the letter. So what is experience? It is a going through experimentum or emperion, in plus peri, threshold, limit, in and out of the limit. The Greek notion of pathos, which became passion, is the passive mind that receives, but that same mind is also active, the active and passive intellect. For Aeschylus, information gathered can only be really done so through pathos. Information gathering, mathesis, is bound to pathesis and becomes patei mathesis. Information about the world, that which is learned through suffering, is fundamentally unpredictable because it is essentially bound to irreducible personal experience. The predictability of the categories of science in fact obscures this process by overdetermining experience before it even happens. This is the same thing as to bind someone to a destiny or a fate and raises important ethical questions. For if we are bound to a certain destiny, or if we are determined by certain sets of decisions, then we at best only live in order to fulfill tasks, decisionism or game theory, or worse, have zero agency. But humans have potentiality, according to Aganda. We have access to the open. I know it's controversial insofar as it's human-centric. But we have zero access to the non-human animal, despite our deepest wish to do so which actually raises a sort of transcendental wish or specter. We are born with the capacity to not understand. Animals don't understand precisely because they don't experience a lack. In linguistic terms, bees cannot misunderstand each other because their language is purely functional, spin this way and that way to tell the other bees where to find the nectar. This is the semiotic, which is about the transmission and reception of signals. Only humans, as far as we can tell, are capable of misunderstanding in a very particular way. Our language <coughs> needs context and is in a world of discourse. This is the semantic sphere. Émile Benveniste, Benveniste as they say in France, a Syrian-born Sephardic Jew who studied in France and became what some consider to be the greatest linguist of the 20th century, sorry Chomsky, but who went almost entirely unnoticed in the Anglo-American context. And when he was noticed, it was merely to explain Saussure, even though he fundamentally changed Saussure. He spent his last two years with aphasia. Julia Kristeva, one of his greatest students, along with Barthes, spent many days at his bedside in his dying days. Semiotic and semantic, langue and parole, reception transmission versus understanding. Parole becomes understanding. Another level of, sem of the semantic sphere is that enunciation is meta-enunciative. Only human language can talk about itself. I challenge anyone to find another language that can talk about itself. When music tries to describe itself, it still needs to be decoded into a human language to make sense. When the entire novel of Moby Dick has been written with emojis and called Emoji Dick, <laughs> even the most expert users of emojis will never be able to reconvert Emoji Dick back into Moby Dick. There is a threshold of arbitrariness that's simply too far. The other end of that scale might be the traffic light, which, is nev which nevertheless still requires the capacity to interpret code. <laughs> Red equals stop, Green go, blue rose. <laughs> the hieroglyph is further towards the emoji side. However, the words of human language are still arbitrary insofar as they always carry presupposition. The mere fact that they need to be related to another who holds a presupposition about what that word or set of words means. Here love comes in, I say, I love you. Who is the I and the you? This depends on time and place, not space, place. Shifters like I and you 
pronouns depend on a position of enunciation. But even when those are known, who knows what goes on inside the heart of the enunciator? Obviously, saying, I love you, and repeating it over and over becomes a promise, and thus performative, a speech act. When one says, I love you, everyone knows how dangerous that can be. The sort of magic that phrase acquires, because it's a promise. A promise bro broken becomes a curse. Don Juan the seducer is Don Juan the promiser. Don Juan the breaker of promises. See Shoshana Feldman's beautiful book about that. A, cu a couple might repeat the same phrase over decades and its meaning will transform. Early in their love, there will be a great anguish, yearning and pain, but also the overwhelming pleasure and joy, pure happiness that comes from the magic and transformative feelings of love. As they grow older, they might repeat the same three words and it will take on new meanings, whether an empty phrase repeated out of habit, worn out, or out of a renewed sense of deep attachment and enduring passion, and many ways in between. All along, along the citational chain of I love you's, the same phrase, but a different enunciation, a different semantic sphere, a different discursivity. Here's a poem. It's been asserted that rhythm is measure, but a quiet, forgotten voice, the lovely linguist of Aleppo, once said in a short, firm but fragile, later to be silenced voice, that rutmos, or rismos, archaically, was flow, like Heraclitian nights and Heraclitian flux, the epoche and the kairos, times of an opening suspended or a now offering, like a gift, that when the measurers came along, ate our lives. Love plays out two ways. The flow and the measure, Sappho's you burn me, or Ovid's management theories, between the unleashed, unreserved, and control and tyranny. I choose the flow, I choose the man at your back and a thousand others, and the sea, I choose you, and the flow and the stillness and the moment. You smile your smile, and the newness of its promise. End of the poem. Love is magic. It's not something, it's not something you work for or deserve. That's such a Protestant idea. It happens to you like happiness and is fundamentally unpredictable. That's not to say once you fall in love, there aren't things you need to do, which is why, uh, I'll skip that. <laughs> I was gonna quote, was gonna quote another poem. Uh, a, a beautiful poem by Pablo Neruda uh, called Always, but it's about uh, him accepting that she slept with a thousand men, or, uh, but also it's the kind of reference at the same time to Helen of Troy, um, so adultery. Um, we have this notion, so the origin of the origin love story of the West is adultery, in a sense. We have this notion of life tied to rights as if we are owed something like a contract. And I hint here to Butler's discussion of Levinas as the impingement of the other, um, so beyond the contract. This sort of rights-based thinking which characterizes modernity has led to the expectation and to a biopolitical modernity, it's controversial, as if life were predictable. This is why we want to nail down our expectations on Tinder, and thus we don't get love but contracts, like an arranged marriage. This is based on the process of naming, nominalism, form of life or form of law. Life submitted to the criteria of rationality and instrumentality. On the other hand, you can desire to love, and then it arrives, because the desire predicts. But the arrival is unpredictable, not what you had in mind. But you let it happen. It happens to you and provides your subjectivity rather than being the result of your subjective control. <laughs>